Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, for this wonderful talk by Steve Zerigian on Ansel Adams. Just a few things uh, have to go over is we ask that you remain on mute during the talk. Um, you are welcome to put any questions you may have in the chat or any comments in the chat. Uh, at the end of Steve's presentation, we will look at those questions and go over them with Steve, or you'll be able to unmute yourself then to ask questions directly to Steve. Um, we are recording this and it will be available for the general public on our YouTube channel in a couple weeks. And I think we're probably about ready to move forward. Sarah Vargas um, is our curator and curated the Ansel Adams exhibition that we have currently at the museum. And if you haven't seen it, you have to come see it. Um, and I am going to let her introduce Steve. Take it away, Sarah. All right, thank you. So first I'm gonna talk a little bit about the exhibition and then I will introduce Steve. So hello everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, as Susan said, my name is Sarah Vargas and I am the curator at the Fresno Art Museum. So landscape images have fascinated people since humanity began creating art. Thus is it no surprise that with the birth of photography, landscapes became one of the most popular genres. And in the realm of landscape photographers, Ansel Adams is king. Best known for his bold black and white photographs of the American West, Ansel Adams was arguably one of the greatest and most influential artists of the 20th century. Born on February 20th, 1902 in San Francisco, Ansel Easton Adams was entranced by nature from an early age and always enjoyed the outdoors. As a child, he loved playing the piano and dreamed of one day being a professional concert pianist. However, the trajectory of his life changed when he was 14 years old. Ansel Adams first stepped foot in Yosemite National Park in June of 1916 on a family vacation. His parents had gifted him a Kodak number no. one brownie camera in order to document the trip. And the rest is history. This exhibition commemorates the 120th anniversary of Adams' birth and also the 100th anniversary of the first publication of his images in the Sierra Club Journal in the January 1922 edition. This is an image of that journal. I don't have images inside of the actual photographs, I'm sorry. He joined the Sierra Club in 1919 at the age of 17, and it would become a very important part of his life. So there are 24 works in the exhibition and they are all from the museum's permanent collection. They encompass most of the American West with an emphasis on California and of course Yosemite, but there's also Wyoming, New Mexico, Arizona, uh, Alaska, Washington State, and even Tennessee. Adam's photographs were gelatin silver prints. It was the most commonly used chemical process for black and white photography in the 20th century. So if you have attended the exhibition reception, you have heard me speak pretty extensively about Adam's involvement with environmental advocacy, which stemmed from his involvement with the Sierra Club. He was integral to the establishment of Kings Canyon National Park in 1940 and helped bring awareness to other national parks through his photography. Adams emphasized that he never intentionally made a creative photograph that related directly to an environmental issue. His intention for taking a photograph was rooted in his desire to capture the intense beauty of the wilderness, as well as the emotional reaction one could experience by observing nature. His conservation efforts were a result of his respect for the natural world. Today, April 22nd is Earth Day. And so it is a fitting time to remember the legacy and contributions of Ansel Adams to the world of photography and environmental advocacy. Here with us today is Steve Zerigian, who many of you might know quite well. He will be speaking about the lasting legacy of Adams's work, its influence on other artists, and he will also be giving us a tour of his studio space 
and some of his current work. So like many photographers of the natural world, Steve Zaragian has a deep and abiding respect for Ansel Adams's work and incorporates similar techniques and photography equipment in his own art to translate the natural world to paper by his own mental impression and emotional response to a subject. Ansel Adams has long been an inspiration. In 1981, Steve had the privilege to serve as an assistant to Ansel Adams on the first major field expedition using the Polaroid Corporation's 20 by 24 instant camera in Yosemite National Park. That experience marked the beginning of his connection to Ansel Adams and the Ansel Adams Gallery. From 1984 to 1990, he was an active staff member and a past director of their annual workshop. Devoted to facilitating art and education in Central California for the last 45 years, Steve has served as curator, juror, and consultant for many exhibitions, competitions, and media events, in addition to teaching photography full-time at Fresno City College. In 1979, he expanded the idea of a local gallery by gathering together charter members to create Spectrum Art Gallery a nonprofit cooperative still providing valuable services to the community. Through a multitude of one-person and group shows, including at the Fresno Art Museum, Steve Zarigian's works have been exhibited throughout the United States. His work has been included in numerous publications, including his recently released book, Trail of Stones, My Path in Photography, published by the press at California State University, Fresno. And so, I forgot to show you a picture of Steve, there he is. <laughs> and so I would like to turn this uh, presentation over to Steve now. Welcome everybody. Thanks uh, so much for joining us. Um, thank you, Sarah and uh, uh, Susan uh, for putting this uh, together as well as the rest of you wonderful staff at the Fresno Art Museum who continue to honor great contributions of artists and art supporters in our community. I hope everyone will visit many times the wonderfully curated and elegantly displayed exhibitions currently decking the walls of the Fresno Art Museum. Of course, on this Earth Day, I'm honored to discuss the influence of Ansel Adams and how masterful traditions impacted my work through a virtual tour of what one would see in, in my studio. For multitudes who either make or appreciate photographic art today, the burning desire to create, illuminate, and come to the aid of our fragile natural environment was sparked or at least fanned by the contributions of Ansel Adams. Through not only his spectacular prints and books, but through education, conservation, and a more robust appreciation of creative fine art photography. My knowledge of Adams started with images and publications, specifically his Saguaro Cactus Sunrise, Arizona, 1946, that you see here. I was bowled over by the ex this expressive example of tactile and spatial qualities possible in, in this medium. Now later, I, I believe it was in 75, uh, the Fresno Art Museum featured an impressive one person uh, exhibition by Adams. Uh, some of you may have att attended that. Um, uh, others weren't born. <laughs> but uh, uh, we have um, uh, by 79 or 80, uh, Photosynthesis, my small darkroom rental and gallery business, exhibited Ansel's magnificent Portfolio 7. Then in 81, I was invited to assist in this Polaroid 20 by 24 field project coinciding with the annual two week long Ansel Adams summer workshop. Now, in the 19th century, master and apprentice relationships uh, were how photographic knowledge was passed back and forth. There were a few journals, uh, but uh, really um, uh, it, it was uh, within a studio and that master apprentice uh, passage. And now Ansel um, uh, had his own set of assistants and he would have one uh, primary technical assistant, but um, uh, he was entrenched in the concept of passing his information on. And he often talked about uh, how uh, he had no special teaching style other than to 
describe and inform how he approached the medium. His background um, um, started with workshops uh, occasionally at the Art Center School in Los Angeles, uh, where co-teacher Fred Archer worked with him together to develop the zone system. The zone system is a, a wonderful method uh, uh, to uh, allow the maximum creative use of the traditional gelatin silver uh, process. Uh, aspects of it continue to this, to this day uh, with our modern Photoshop and digital cameras, etc. Now, uh, he began U.S. Uh, camera forums in Yosemite in the summer of 1940 when he invited Edward Weston to join him. Uh, by 1946, he set up a Department of Photography at the California School of Fine Arts, uh, now called San Francisco Art Institute. And um, he was followed by the, the uh, wonderful artist and uh, great instructor, Minor White. And from 1955 through 1981, he did the Ansel Adams workshops in Yosemite Valley and thereabouts. But 81 was the last year for that. And he was not feeling very well even that year. Uh, and he, we, um, the project was conceived uh, by, um, uh, in conjunction with the, with the Ansel Adams workshop uh, by Roger Grégoire, who I'll show you in a moment. But first of the week, um, uh, he, Ansel was not well enough to work with us in the field. Um, I, my job was to drive a 23 foot uh, long um, U-Haul uh, gadget bag uh, around Yosemite and, um, and work with uh, two available uh, instructors, uh, lead instructors from his workshop, Morley Bear, and Marie Cosindis, and here's an image of Morley uh, at the helm. Now, Roger uh, was the person responsible for this, uh, this project, uh, and he hired um, uh, five of us to, uh, or four others, uh, to, to work with him. Uh, at the front standard here, you see Norman Locks, who was, uh, had a strong relationship with Polaroid. He was doing manipulated uh, Polaroid SX-70s at, at, at that time and before that, um, and was one of the great innovators with the Polaroid materials. His chore was to operate, um, or rather to take the light meter readings and, um, and uh, uh, filtration uh, 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 combinations to use. And my job was like Roger is doing here was to release the shutter, adjust the f-stops and shutter speed and uh, control the front standard of the camera. This was a huge uh, 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 monstrosity, 250 pounds. Um, and uh, 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 when Ansel was ready, we moved the, this uh, camera up through the elevators at the Iwani Hotel and um, worked out of his second story suite of uh, his room. Uh, here we have Roger uh, uh, operating the back of the camera. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with this format, it was a peel apart um, Polaroid that was common in the, the, from the 50s uh, um, on through the 70s uh, and a little bellows built into the camera and you would uh, 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 pull a little sheet out and peel it apart after 60 seconds and you had an instant print. Well, this was a 20 by 24 version. And um, what, what our team would do would be to um, get everything ready, uh, process a picture that uh, Ansel or whoever was operating the camera would uh, advise for composition and bring the print in uh, to his room and he would uh, inspect it and advise uh, filtration changes, um, uh, make adjustments on the standards. It was a, a, a view camera uh, structure. So um, there were lots of uh, adjustments to be made. We'd go back out and we'd test out what he wanted to do. And uh, the, the goal of this particular project was to produce signed prints by Ansel um, that would go to each million dollar plus client of Polaroid throughout the world. 
Polaroid products. And uh, here we see uh, John Schaefer, um, uh, then the director for the Center for Creative Photography in Tucson, which housed Ansel's, um, uh, uh, the bulk of Ansel's uh, legacy with regard to negatives and uh, prints, etc. Now, if you want more information, you have to go to my book or talk to me personally, and you, there's a chapter on that particular project. But Ansel's legacy um, was, as I mentioned, in, in various areas of education, um, aside from his fantastic photography and, and how it impacted uh, the photo world, uh, but from 55 to 81, I mentioned that he had the Ansel Adams workshops, but moved that after 81 uh, to Carmel and worked through the Friends of Photography, uh, another organization that he was key in, in creating, um, and which was the, at, the, at that time the largest organization in the world uh, of its kind. And the workshops in Yosemite continued thereafter, uh, by uh, the Ansel Adams Gallery. And um, they kept that traditional uh, workshop format where there would be about 80 participants um, divided up into um, groups of um, 15 or 20. Um, and uh, I was, uh, I worked from 84 through 90 when the program ended. Um, uh, f f in this intensive, wonderful uh, atmosphere of, ed of concentrated education. Now, my job would be to take my my subgroup of of say twenty uh, uh, fifteen or twenty students to each key uh, or lead instructor. In this case, this is David Bales here, um, who is the co-author of um, a seminal book uh, called Art and fear, observations on the perils and rewards of art making. And he's describing his version of the zone system that Ansel Adams uh, um, uh, and Fred Archer brought forth uh, to the photographic world. Just to give you an idea what the makeup of a workshop like this might be, uh, there were students, uh, some of the students in these prior workshops were such figures as Sally Mann, um, uh, uh, Ted Orland, Chris Johnson, um, all kinds of uh, fantastic artists. In this one, we have Dan Burkholder in our, in our group. He as, served as an assistant as well. And he went on to be the author of Making Digital Negatives, the first uh, uh, key book in uh, creating digital negatives to print in the wet darkroom. Um, and is still out there doing fantastic educational workshops. We have Christopher Deerdorf here. We have Susie Morrill and a dear friend of, of uh, Spectrum Art Galleries, uh, Jeff Nicholas, who uh, passed away a couple of years ago and we're honoring him at Spectrum with a major retrospective uh, coming up this summer. We've been waiting for COVID uh, lockdown uh, to open up and now is the time when people can participate more. So I encourage you to get out there to the museum and see all the shows and as well as to Spectrum Art Gallery and other galleries around. Now, the, when I was working for the workshop, uh, it, they, worked, they, uh, ha they had the similar uh, format as Ansel did. Uh, we invited four uh, lead instructors and um, uh, uh, there would be a list made and uh, we would go over who we were going to invite. Now, in 1983, uh, one of the lead instructors was Todd Walker, whose image you see here. Some of you may not be familiar with his work, but he was the one of the earliest uh, uh, artists in photography to do digital work. And his uh, what he brought to the workshop program influenced a whole bunch of others, um, and, in, including uh, Ted Orland, if I can get this to click here, who you see here. And Ted Orland was Ansel's former um, technical assistant. And he is the co-author of that book with David Bales, Art and Fear. Uh, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's a simple little book, outstanding for the creative uh, person uh, to explore and, and uh, 
read and reread. Now, this is what, <laughs> for those of you who are steeped in digital photography, this is what the early, early forms were like. Uh, uh, Todd would use a, um, um, a video surveillance camera and it would be connected to a, a PC. Some of you may remember these early uh, uh, app, uh, Apple uh, PCs. And then it would be connected to a dot matrix printer, very, very low resolution. And here's Ted talking to my subgroup in that workshop of 1990, demonstrating early digital technique. And this is the back of Ansel and Virginia's home in Yosemite. Okay. Um, Ted did this wonderful portrait uh, of Ansel Adams and Imogen Cunningham, according Jerry Yulesman, the title of honorary West Coast photographer at Weston Beach, Point Lobos, 1969. And uh, it's especially a poignant picture uh, now because Jerry just passed away uh, in uh, earlier this month. And um, uh, Ansel was not just involved with the workshop and those other programs. He also did a critical uh, thing with uh, Imogen Cunningham uh, by being one of the founding members of um, F64, which we'll talk about in a moment. Some more snapshots from the workshop in 1990. Uh, here's the hallway between the house and then the dark room, which you'll see in a moment. Uh, and here's uh, Jerry. Uh, uh, taking a break from doing a demonstration of his marvelous combination printing, where he used multiple enlargers and move the paper back and forth to uh, put uh, pieces of the images together. Uh, and the kind of students that we had in the workshop, this is Christopher Burkett. And uh, uh, he later on became uh, uh, one of the great masters of color photography. If you go to Photography West in Carmel, uh, or if you go to the Ansel Adams Gallery in Yosemite, you see these amazing uh, handmade uh, 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 prints uh, from his 8x10 camera. Annette Pataro Walklet, wonderful photographer and then uh, director of the workshop. Gordon Brown from Eastman Kodak, uh, uh, conversing with Jerry Yulesman. Uh, and this is the uh, the other side of Ansel and Virginia's home. They lived there behind what would be the Ansel Adams Gallery today. The dark room itself um, was, is still maintained. It's, it has uh, more up-to-date uh, equipment uh, stored in there from time to time, but they still have an, a, a tremendous program of workshops. They no longer do the two week long um, uh, uh, sessions that we used to do that sort of ended in the 90s. Um, it ended in 1990. But here we, I'm, we're back in the workshop, uh, or rather in the dark room uh, that Ansel did all uh, a whole bunch of his seminal work. Um, this is uh, taken in 2002. I was a co-coordinator with Gene Adams uh, for the Ansel Adams Centennial Symposium in Yosemite, commemorating what would have been his 100th birthday. It was a major event that became an amazing gathering of photographic greats, including every one of his assistants that was physically able to attend. Now, um, integrally involved with the workshop program, I was able to submit a list of who I felt uh, I wanted uh, to see invited as lead instructors. And one year um, I got my wish and uh, Annie Leibovitz and David Hockney were two really top on my list, actually the very top of that particular list that year. And uh, as uh, in Jeannie's inimitable way, uh, she managed to get both of them uh, invited to do the, uh, this wonderful session in 1987. And here she's uh, beginning to talk to her subgroup of students. And I'm going beyond, um, I'm jumping from Ansel's legacy to the people that he encouraged and he, his, uh, what he did, uh, uh, what he gave to our world of education and how it carries on and how it passes, passes it on, as he would say. So in this workshop, 
we uh, this, if those of you that don't know Annie Leibovitz's work, um, uh, uh, he, she had a marvelous way and continues to this day uh, to produce um, portraits that are very telling and, uh, and uh, wonderfully integrate uh, the, the, the subjects, ideas, and feelings as well as her own, and especially involving the context um, uh, and accoutrements of the of the the photograph. Um, now, the this is a portrait of David Byrne of the Talking Heads done in 1986. And the following year, uh, she was doing um, a mountain climber here in the Yosemite Valley at at uh, Tunnel View for our workshop. And um, the climber had to hurt himself. And uh, the, uh, as many of you know, uh, there's a very active subculture of, of climbing that uh, works uh, throughout the valley uh, and, and um, wanted to be, uh, to use one of these uh, uh, beautiful um, uh, figures of, of uh, uh, human health and, and uh, exuberance uh, to do a portrait there at Tunnel View. And so uh, she would, uh, she had an assistant with her and brought all of her lighting equipment to uh, combine the available light um, uh, with uh, artificial uh, light to create these beautiful um, portraits. Um, and she would guide uh, the, the model and uh, instruct how uh, the, he might be placed to bring the most out of the composition. And uh, he, she would be explaining this to our group so they could see the process. So it was a lot of fun. Now, one thing that we would do um, with our students and instructors, um, would we, we would take them to places that Ansel liked to work. And um, so this was a point, not at Tunnel View, but a little hiking distance away that Ansel loved to work from and um, uh, which he did clearing winter storm. When you go into the museum, you'll see the, the in-person picture of that. Um, but here I, I thought it was nice to make a quiet uh, portrait of Annie in a contemplative state. Yosemite was one of her favorite spots. And if you ever saw that traveling show recently of her, um, uh, the crossed, be, went beyond uh, uh, portraiture, uh, the Yosemite was a big part of that. But this is the point where Clearing Winter Storm was made by Ansel Adams. And um, the other co-instructor on this particular workshop was David Hockney. And David Hockney was doing these um, uh, photographic collages. Uh, he did them with SX-70s. He had a relationship with Polaroid as well. Uh, and uh, this is a great example. This is not an SX-70 collage, but I'll talk about his process in a moment. This is a great example. The Getty Museum owns this. If you ever get a chance to see it in person, it's wonderful. Um, and this is done not just in one session. It's done from April 11th to the 18th in 1986. And I'll explain how that's done in a moment. So Hockney, um, as many of you know, um, established his early reputation as a painter. And, um, but he took on photography in a really serious and innovative uh, scholarly way. Um, uh, and uh, uh, this was prior to um, his uh, publishing what was called Secret Knowledge, Rediscovering the Lost Techniques of the Old Masters, which was done in 2001. So this is a a portrait from his field session. Um, and um, uh, what, he, what we would do with these sessions in the, in the Ansel Adams uh, 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 gallery workshops, we would have one session usually indoors. Um, uh, a lead instructor would have a keynote speech at, at night uh, and uh, our group would cycle through uh, a field session with the same instructor if they so chose. And in this field session, uh, David, uh, this is the indoor, or rather just outside the, uh, the indoor meeting place, uh, where he put this collage together that he did in the field um, uh, and demonstrating to our group. 
and he would take a small format camera, um, a 35 millimeter film, uh, and photograph throughout the scene different sections of the, uh, the subject, including the context of the environment uh, in such a way that it, it combines space and time in an, a novel um, end product. Much more could be said about this, but here's the process. Um, uh, he would lay out these four by six prints that he took to the one hour processing kiosk uh, in Yosemite Valley uh, uh, behind the grocery store or wherever it was at that time and um, uh, get them back for the next session and lay them out. He didn't mind if there was color variation or density variation, that sort of made it come alive. And you saw that with Pear Blossom Hi Highway as well. Um, and um, uh, this is his assistant, uh, Charlie, and, um, and uh, Charlie was the model for the photograph too. Uh, and so we would be sitting around and in the group and here's Jeannie Adams and he would uh, describe his process, uh, uh, entertain feedback uh, from the group. It was just a, a wonderful session. And um, uh, the, the end product is a one of a kind. Uh, I had to get special permission to even have it in my book. I have uh, one snapshot from uh, this session in my book, so I had to get uh, special permission from David uh, to, um, uh, uh, to use that. Okay, now, so let's talk more about legacy and, and how Ansel's legacy got in, in uh, its uh, uh, sort of dynamic uh, kick. And um, Adams took his portfolio uh, to New York City and showed it to Alfred Stieglitz. And Stieglitz was quite taken with his work. And um, uh, that gave, uh, that really served as a tremendous boost to Adam's uh, motivation. Now, so in 1936, he showed the work of Ansel Adams in one of his galleries. And um, he, Stieglitz, like other predecessors, Ansel did this when he, in his youth, uh, Imogen Cunningham did the same thing. Um, Paul Strand, a, a, a whole bunch of folks started off in what was called the pictorialist tradition at the end of the 19th century, in the beginning of the 20th century. Clear, straight photography was very um, uh, established. And uh, the, uh, the artists at the time wanted to uh, sort of secede from that movement and be more like painters. And, and uh, there's a great history behind it, uh, the, the, uh, but um, I'll only touch on it now. But Stieglitz himself was a key figure. He published a journal called Camera Work. Uh, he encouraged um, uh, artists like George O'Keefe. This is his painting of George O'Keefe uh, in the background there above his head. I think it's one of my favorite Ansel Adams portraits. Um, um, this of, of uh, Stieglitz behind uh, in front of O'Keeffe's painting. Now, he also brought uh, to the forefront um, Picasso into his little galleries and uh, John Maron, all kinds of artists uh, were uh, shown in, in his galleries. Now, at the end of, um, at the sort of the end of not the end, but later in Alfred Stieglitz's career, as well as um, uh, Adams made this shift and Cunningham made this shift as, as well. They sort of moved in the direction of clear and straight uh, photographic reproduction being worthy as, as a pure fine art in its own right. Um, the, the, a predecessor, P.H. Emerson, had done this uh, prior. Uh, but uh, Stieglitz in his last uh, issue of camera work devoted it to um, Paul, the work of Paul Strand espousing that methodology as being valid and um, uh, hoping that the, the larger art world would, um, would uh, adopt this or become familiar enough with it. Uh, he and a group of others uh, put together um, the 
had a meeting at Willard Van Dyke's home and created what was called Group F64. And this was Ansel's contribution. This is Ansel Adams' photograph to the first Group F64 show, which was in November of 1932. Now, some more about influences uh, and legacies. Um, this is Timothy O'Sullivan's Ancient Ruins in Canyon de Chelly, 1873. So the original looks like this. I took out the color so you could see um, how much, how similar it is to Ansel's uh, version. Um, each person um, uh, sort of um, can approach the subject and there can be very great similarities and there can be great disparities in how uh, one interprets that. And, and, uh, and Ansel Adams uh, 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 was no exception. Um, they, I was very impressed by this early morning Merced River um, uh, photograph of Ansel's that he did in 1950. And after the workshop program ended, I was uh, 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 work. I worked with. I was invited to what was called the Yosemite Photographic Survey uh, by Brian Grogan, and Brian um, uh, organized a group of photographers to photograph uh, uh, a Yosemite uh, post a hundred years of it being a park, and um, and so one of my uh, 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 concepts was to do an homage to uh, uh, very uh, familiar Ansel Adams and Edward Weston uh, uh, photographs and uh, view them from the side or a different vantage point. So this is the same tree uh, and uh, many people photograph the same tree. And it, it, it involves that, that concept of the homage and uh, working with uh, a rephotographic trend, which uh, uh, has occurred um, uh, in that latter part of the 20th century. Now, <clears throat> some pictures in, in the survey, uh, these are all done in uh, uh, 1991, were more like, quite a bit like Ansel's. Uh, so you, you can see, especially the influence on that one um, uh, in, in uh, uh, both the composition and the way it's handled. But I, then I focused more on the, um, the impact of human uh, interaction with the park and the impact of fire. Uh, so here's one from El Capitan Meadow. And here's one at the aftermath of the Foresta fire in 1991. All the time uh, I was using um, the, the methodology of, of uh, Adams, the zone system. And um, the, my, a lot of them are just not pretty pictures, but that's not the point. The point is that if a viewer sees this and they slow down sometime when they're in there or they watch where they walk or they are concerned with what they do or get permission to do what they need to do, that the, the, our natural resources will be more protected. And it, uh, the photographer's dilemma is that the more they get out there, just like Adams, his footsteps are followed by a multitude of, of other photographers and artists, um, and that all can trample what the beauty that was there. So we have to be good stewards of our environment if we're going to work with landscape and, uh, and, and follow those lessons, uh, that part of Ansel's legacy. So one of the places he loved to go to was the Glacier Erratic Boulder Field near Tenaya Lake. And um, um, this image, it, it, this is right there in the bookstore at the Fresno Art Museum. Um, they have a, a few of these images. But anyway, um, one of the things that we would do, we, we would take people, our group up to, and uh, the spot where Edward Weston made this Juniper Lake Tenaya, 1937. Ansel helped w Weston um, access some of these things about the national park, uh, some of these places and special um, uh, uh, phenomena 
that uh, that could be found only by the kind of trekking that Ansel would do throughout the wilderness. And he did so much of that. So he took Edward into that spot. And then fittingly, uh, the people that came after him, uh, like photographer Jerry Yulesman, who was teaching in the workshop, went up there and we were working up in the same area. So this was his interpretation of Weston's, uh, um, uh, Weston's juniper, like uh, 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 Tanaya. And here he's using uh, multiple negatives, one flipped, one in one enlarger, the other one flipped backwards, uh, uh, and, um, and then a third and larger uh, to add uh, by combination printing, burning and dodging and masking uh, this Egyptian uh, icon. And this is um, uh, untitled, but it has a nickname of Tree Goddess, 1994. Yulesman was a great influence on a whole bunch of other photographers. His, his influences were people like um, not only people like Weston and Adams, but Harry Callahan and uh, especially Minor White. And Minor White uh, re in inherited or really uh, moved forward with the concept that Stieglitz had before him on equivalence. And Ansel was infected, uh, uh, not infected, <laughs> affected. Uh, yes, actually, infected sounds a little bit more realistic because once we get the bug on something, we it's like an inf infection. Um, so Yulesman um, worked with this idea that that images could be symbolic of one's feelings. And he would refer to his as obviously symbolic, but not symbolically obvious. This was a great influence on me. And I'll take you in here to my studio here in a moment. Uh, but I'm still talking about legacies and influences. And um, Adams was a great proponent of all of that. He wanted to see um, this information pass forward. Now, this is Doug Prince's um, uh, creation of multiple images in a plexiglass light box that is rear illuminated. Um, and when you go up to it, it sits on a pedestal. You look from side to side and you get this dimensionality uh, from it. Uh, my other influence uh, besides Jerry and Doug uh, were, um, uh, was uh, Jerry McMillan. I had a uh, one class from him in 1971 at UCLA, and I just it turned me uh, uh, around. And um, and I actually was more familiar with these folks before I was with Adams. Um, and um, uh, he would do paper bag constructions again, uh, it would, combining sculpture and photography, and the illusion of three dimensionality and two dimensionality. And some of them would be hand colored like this in the background. Uh, and he, the whole bag itself was constructed by him. So he's combining sculpture and photography. That happened a great deal in the, in the 60s and 70s, um, uh, influenced by the early uh, movements in art of Dada and surrealism. And in 68, I was very um, taken by the Dada and surrealism show at the LACMA uh, um, in uh, uh, a traveling show that ended up in the uh, uh, Los Angeles uh, uh, County Museum of Art. And here's Marcel Duchamp's uh, uh, The Bride Strip Bear by her bachelor even. And here the, the, the work is on glass, the glass is broken, you see through the glass, uh, there's dimensionality, you can move around it. It was a really exciting for me. And I thought it would be wonderful to um, work with those things. So in 71, uh, right after I got out of Jerry's class, I was excited by um, doing photo collage, cut and paste uh, on glass. And I only did a couple of them, maybe three of them. Uh, then later in, uh, uh, in the 2000s, I decided to revisit it and create some um, uh, uh, shadow box constructions. So this is a collage combining two images, uh, one of them cut out and uh, the, the window of which would be gone, uh, revealing the, the 
print underneath it. And um, they were arranged um, by uh, uh, collecting uh, lots of prints. I approach uh, photo photo photographing in the field in the studio fairly directly. And then, um, uh, and then once I have prints, uh, sometimes they call to one another to uh, be joined in a, in a, uh, because they are something that resonates between them. And um, so I look for a feeling of exciting connection. Um, they're usually end up being unconscious analogies. Uh, I refer to this series as the logic of the subconscious. Um, and, um, and so I'll put these images together and, and later I realize uh, that they sort of mirror sort of a vis uh, an extension of a visual uh, autobiography. Some of them are ha have hand applied um, color pencil and, um, and some of them float above the background. And when you move from side to side, you kind of see that uh, dimensionality. Now we're gonna to switch to the studio here for a moment. All right, so this is my studio and uh, you'll see that um, there are, I had the great opportunity of um, helping uh, Gene and Michael uh, Adams get Ansel's darkroom ready for the Rick Burns documentary on his work that was pub, uh, that was uh, in the, I guess it was in the American Master series. I'm not positive, but it was a great film. Uh, it, great interview with John Sarkowski. And um, so uh, the, I saw how many similarities there were in, uh, in, in the way we, the way we work uh, in in the studio area, but mine is compacted into a hugely small space where every square inch is filled um, with here are unmounted prints, solid prints there, um, backups from editions, etc. Uh, and then um, these cases are loaded with. Uh, mounted prints and negatives. And um, uh, there's a place to shrink wrap material. There's a place to uh, lay out for over matting. I do everything by hand myself. Uh, so it's a, a tedious uh, process, but I like to have that kind of control. But all of these cases are filled with, with prints. Um, now, uh, I do my own over matting there. And uh, I take profuse notes uh, that um, I can repeat a process as closely as I can after I've done all the testing for it. Um, uh, this, this dark room was a converted garage and uh, it is, um, uh, was converted into this funky apartment. And uh, I, we moved in in, in 77 and um, it hasn't really been adjusted too much. We use an eight by 10 and larger. Uh, these are, this is a wind bullock um, uh, result of the, the printer, the apprentice for wind bullock, Jim Hill, the jiggle machine, which I used to tell my students about a, a dodging and burning tool to help um, specific dodge and burn specific areas on a print. Here's another larger jiggle machine. And here's a little bit of Ansel Juju from organizing, um, uh, helping Jeannie with, with uh, her organization. So I, uh, there's a little um, bit of uh, uh, that little bit of Ansel in my dark room. And um, when I was uh, teaching, I gave, um, before I retired, I gave uh, a little bit of chemistry to all my lab assistants that came from that because we couldn't dispose of it. It's, so hopefully it's, uh, safe in other people's collections. Uh, this is the drying area and archival, everything is done um, for archival processing. So it's, they, they last the most uh, in terms of permanence. Now we're going to, and then uh, here are mount presses and lots of files. Uh, every square inch, as I say, is, is sort of filled with something. Now we're going to move on into the other area of the studio. 
if I can uh, bring this up there, here we go. So sometimes I, I for one, uh, one or two series uh, of my work, I use um, a studio and I have, I manipulate um, uh, my model who I'll tell you, show you in a moment. And those are some Christmas tree lights that you'll see the results of, of uh, what they do. There's my theremin. Um, and uh, the, the work in this series that I continue to do are um, three dimensional, they're, they're sort of slightly three dimensional um, uh, shadow box arrangements with uh, part of the image on glass suspended above a background. And um, so I work with that um, uh, whenever the um, feeling moves me. And usually that's uh, that feeling of resonance when uh, one image uh, uh, seems like it should be joined with another or another two images. You're usually one or two, or two or maybe three together. And um, I work pretty unconsciously uh, in a methodology that, that uh, Robinson Jeffers called stone loving stone, um, where you move things around and see how they fit and then finally secure them. And uh, this is a result of the, um, the, the COVID um, lockdown. This is 2020. And uh, ironically, that is an image, uh, those are, uh, the doctor's office in Bodhi that was was existent uh, during the first pandemic, um, post World War One, and I sometimes I'll have images together in a light box. I make transparencies and combine them. Uh, that's again that's that surrealist uh, influence. That's that kind of um, uh, experiencing what came before and and uh, moving it in a personal way that. Uh, that resonates. And um, more storage, uh, we're running out of space. Got to <laughs> find some, some larger way, uh, uh, lar uh, some uh, larger space to uh, expand. Um, I'm on the older side, so I don't know when that, how much further it's going to expand. And that's a, a slide projector, a slide projector that I project onto this mannequin you see here and um, we'll, quit this in a second and you'll see how that uh, particular, um, those elements end up in, in work. Okay, so last part of the little studio tour is uh, here. Um, and uh, this is the, uh, the digital aspect. Um, uh, when I retired from Fresno City College, I had to bring all my, uh, office accoutrements and, and uh, library here. And um, uh, I have tons of slides, there are 35,000 slides, uh, out of which maybe 200 have been scanned. Um, and the, there are probably only maybe 500 that are worth uh, scanning, but lots of uh, variations and duplications. And if it wasn't garbage, I saved it. And uh, sometimes I, uh, I find ways of using it. Whoops, ah, sorry about that. Touch the wrong button, go back there. All right, try that again. Okay, move it forward here. And there we go, okay. And um, just a simple scanner and a couple of, uh, the workstation looks similar to this, uh, looks like this. And then uh, there's my son Ronald's uh, early sculpture. Uh, some of you may know his work, Ronald Zerigian. And um, then here are, um, uh, these are the edited slides and then more archives back there. Okay, so I'm going to switch back to the PowerPoint here. Whoops, if I can click the right thing. Thinking, ah, there, whoop. come on, you little slippery little dog. Okay, here we go. 
All right, that's not where we want to begin, but uh, let's see here. Sorry about that. And we will get back to where we were. Here we go. And so here's a, uh, uh, a single image of that. Is this clear on the screen? I mean, can you see the whole image now? Yes. Nod your head. Okay, great. All right. So uh, this, this is that mannequin, uh, an old slide projected on that, and then Christmas tree lights uh, moving in the background. I use long exposures and, um, and work with uh, the mannequin. Um, uh, and sometimes I've used faces, uh, but it, that kind of, um, uh, that element repeats itself in a lot of my work. This is one again, once again, one of the shadow box arrangements. Now, another major influence um, was Imogen Cunningham. And uh, she's one of those early pictorialists uh, who went on to be a, a key figure in the F64 group. And uh, she is probably the most, uh, uh, was the most creatively experimental of that group. And um, her work always stayed with me. Uh, I, I loved the fact that um, she incorporated uh, um, uh, uh, self-portraits in her um, in her legacy. And if you ever get a chance to see, go down to the Getty Museum, you will see a major uh, retrospective of her work right now. Uh, so I would use this combination of Ansel's techniques and Imogen's techniques. And usually I have um, a, a visual one entry into a visual autobiography that ends up uh, uh, being kept. So these are from 1975, a uh, lot less hair uh, today. And here's one from 2016 on one of our Spectrum Art Gallery uh, workshops um, to the Alabama Hills. And this is done at 10 o'clock at night. And um, um, again, using really simple uh, techniques, long exposure, etc. Now, Ansel um, was also e experimenting and trying different things and was very influenced by uh, the masters that came before him too. Uh, one thing that he established with his zone system method of development and exposure um, and uh, was a um, this image, it's described in the making of 40 images called the Black Sun, Tungsten Hills, Owens Valley, done in 1939. And I always took it, whoops, pardon me. I always took it as a challenge that it, whenever I had a sun in my picture, um, um, I would um, uh, try to get that same effect by using the zone system and the right amount of light. So uh, in this case, um, uh, the sun was uh, a good centering device for the composition that I wanted to do. And I made uh, 10 negatives uh, that, um, um, that uh, out of only three of them did the black sun uh, reverse in that same way. Went on to do a series of rock alignments uh, in the um, in the same area. I'll go back and document the same um, uh, spot and how people manipulate the rocks. These are not created by me. They're they're documents of what other people have done. My only um, um, uh, added uh, quality is that I usually apply some color pencil uh, to the surface of the series. So I work in, in series and I continue not all at one time that whenever I can add to a series, I do it. And then uh, sometimes I'll show those in, in um, separately edited in the final result. Okay, how are we doing on time, Susan? Are we close to the end here? We're okay so far. Um, okay. Soon. Okay. So we got a few more to go through, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Um, now, another important influence on uh, 
Stieglitz and Adams, and um, this more of a contemporary of Stieglitz, was Frederick Evans. And this is his sea of steps. He was a pictorialist in the beginning, soft focus, very uh, um, uh, painterly kind of uh, photographs that he would do, similar to Ansel's early work, what were called the Parmalian prints, where he used that soft focus and brown tones, etc. cetera. And, um, but Evans also had this uh, streak of straight, pure photography. And, um, and uh, the, I was so taken by how he uh, worked with steps um, and uh, it resonated with me. And uh, I, whenever I see steps, I'll work with them, uh, utilizing um, some of these techniques of the masters and tweaking them uh, uh, to you know, make them work for myself. Now, um, I do uh, one sequence that I do is uh, what I call ascending views, where I'm looking straight up at subject matter. And uh, sometimes I'll add uh, color. This is our own Forestier underground gardens. And, um, um, uh, and I love the, uh, the way that uh, the color pencil allows part of the image to come forward. Um, so that's... Uh, painstakingly added prisma uh, blended in with uh, Q-tips. Architectural things uh, attract me as well. And uh, so I tend to work with them. Ansel had a lot of architecture in his work. Uh, he was a commercial photographer and, uh, and as such, he had to be get very good at working with uh, 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 it's pleasing his clients on accurate and dramatic uh, uh, depictions of, of uh, buildings, and um, uh, I'm all I'm still fascinated with uh, with architecture, whether ancient or or modern. Another uh, uh, influence was that of Wynne Bullock, uh, whose picture you see here. Uh, this is Sunken Wreck, done in 1968. Uh, Bullock, along with, uh, with Adams and Brett Weston and a few others were those uh, beginning, um, uh, uh, started the Friends of Photography in Carmel. And um, Bullock, what, one of the things that he added uh, to the mix that affected so many modern photographers was the use of motion in time. So this kind of image would be made by capping and uncapping the lens on his eight by 10 or other camera with a very long exposure, waiting for waves to splash on the surf. And with multiples of these uh, overlapped on the same exposure, it comes across as mist instead of stopping droplets in midair. That technique is very attractive. Uh, lots of landscape photographers use it, variations of that these days uh, to really unbelievable uh, lengths they go. And um, uh, I, I love that kind of misty look. And uh, so I went with a longer exposure, in this case, uh, Remnants of Crossing, Lake Atitlan in 2006, and um, uh, achieved by a long exposure so you don't see the splashing, the mild splashing of the lake waves, or showing fast motion in water as a stream. Got special permission to work at the Friant Dam and um, then added hand coloring to the foreground to separate uh, that from the background. Fresno, California. Tikal. Now I've, I've been using a heavier application of color pencil, uh, almost a full color in some cases. So that's another subseries of, of my work. All right, we're almost at the end here. Now, our interaction with the environment is how I want to wrap this up. Um, Ansel says that, that he didn't have in, that in mind when he made the pictures, but certainly uh, he learned his appreciation for the natural world we got as far as being involved directly with politics to try to conserve our environment. 
And here on Earth Day, we need to be very conscious of, of how we interact with the environment and what we can do to, um, uh, uh, to have responsible stewardship of our, of our Earth. And uh, so I do, part of the purpose for doing my work is a documentation and a statement about the, perhaps the lack of water or um, where we step uh, and what we, what kind of uh, terrain we uh, uh, might uh, interfere with uh, if, if we're not careful. So as you're going out into the world, well, I hope uh, and, and I'm probably preaching to the choir here in this group, uh, but it's it's my hope that the work impacts or gets seen by somebody that it makes a difference. And that's part of the reason for showing work. It's not necessarily the reason for doing it, uh, although it's involved in that, but especially uh, showing it uh, and getting it seen. Uh, here's a, um, a 2020 image of uh, my dear friend uh, Melinda Downing and her husband uh, had a, um, uh, a ca cabin complex destroyed by the Creek Fire. And so uh, this was in a recent uh, show called Extraction uh, at the Center uh, for, uh, for uh, Photographic Art in Carmel, part of a nationwide, actually an international uh, 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 handling an uh, exposition of uh, what we take from the earth and what should be, uh, how we should reconsider that or be more responsible for that and how our effect is upon it. So the, uh, here's, another, here's an example uh, of what can happen. Uh, this was done in 2004 and this is my workshop group, much like in the Adams workshops, I would take groups uh, into the field and we would have sessions. And um, so there were nine of us illuminating uh, the double arch and arches. Well, it wasn't but a year or two after that that somebody took flares out there and illuminated it with, with uh, flammable uh, items. And they it ended up causing a fire. And uh, thereafter, the park uh, became more stringent on, uh, on, on how even photographers can approach what they're doing. So we all need to be very careful and responsible. Ansel's work was really focused on, um, uh, so much of it was about beauty and uh, the nourishment, the lessons uh, that we receive from the earth. And this is one of my all time favorites, uh, White Branches Mono Lake. And so, so much of the time when I go out into nature, that's what I'm focused on. And you can see uh, much of Adam's kind of influence on this kind of work. I do work in color as well and um, uh, don't show it very often. But um, uh, except in social media, uh, which seems to be a wonderful way of getting the word out there as well. So with that in mind, uh, I'm wrapping this up for question time. Any questions? Good. Wow, thank you, Steve. Um, you were so thorough, there aren't any questions in the chat. Um, <laughs> but if, if, any, if anyone, Wants to ask any questions, we have a few minutes that we can do that. You can unmute yourself and just ask. Don't be shy. <laughs> yeah, I've got a question, Steve, or Jim Kernan here. Yes. Uh, on that Polaroid uh, 20 by 24 series you were doing, uh, my wife, Michelle, was asking about the, uh, the, the prints from that. Were they archival? Well, um, they are, they're, they have dyes in them, and those dyes can be affected by light. Uh, they're not as archival as permanent as uh, uh, archival pigments that we're using in the printers these days, but um, it, it's 
you know, I have some that are faded. I have an original um, that I had that I displayed at the CSUF in the Ellipse Gallery uh, with the 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 book um, show at CSUF, uh, the my Trail of Stones uh, lecture and, and gallery show, and there I showed one of the originals, and that hasn't changed a bit, but it's been hidden in darkness, so. It's all a matter of exposure to UV light. Uh, the dyes in most uh, prints will shift. So you have to be careful. Yeah. But they're not going to last like as long as the archival pigment prints, that's for sure. Kodachrome okay. slides, uh, send, their dyes seem to, be, seem to have been more stable than the ectochrome, or the, especially the agfachrome slides. So if you have those old slides in your collections, uh, you need to scan those things and tweak them before you can't. <laughs> I don't know if that answered your question, Jim. It does. OK. Thank you. Other questions? Don't be bashful. Just out of curiosity, is there a particular brand of colored pencil that you used when you color your Oh, images? that's the fun. That's the fun part. Um, you, since I'm dealing with a wet uh, a paper that um, is gets wet. The emulsion swells up, uh, and uh, you can't really, uh, if you uh, abrade the surface, it's ruined. Uh, so uh, I tried watercolor pencils, uh, and um, I think there are some possibilities there with some of the inkjet papers and the watercolor that they're all on. A lot of them are on watercolor paper especially alternative process uh, paper where you're coating uh, arches or reeves or one of these other uh, 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 fine papers, um, you, you, you might be able to get some effects that with the bleeding that happens with water. Uh, but I didn't want that effect. I tried the Marshall Photo oils and they didn't give me the precision that I was after. Uh, those are, don't uh, swell up the emulsion of a dried print. And those are very commonly used, especially for large painting, large areas. Um, so they're great innovators that work with uh, the photo oils. Uh, I tried uh, oil pastels. Um, those were uh, fine, but I liked the control of the Prisma. I was after a very subtle, delicate thing. And I actually don't even like the, the stroke showing. So I use Q-tips to burnish them. Uh, so mm -hmm. that they it doesn't show up, but you need the right kind of paper also. And one of the papers that I used to use is discontinued. So it's a challenge getting the right kind of paper uh, to use for that. But I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. I was just Pris Pris Prismacolor is a is a wax based uh, pencil. And that's not the only brand. There are lots of other wax-based pencils, but I found the variety in Prismacolor to be, uh, and the accessibility of getting them uh, to be useful. Thank you, thank you, just curious. Anyone else have any? Okay, unmute yourself. Okay, it's a comment actually, uh, particularly for Steve. Uh, I was on a, backcountry trip one time, Jerry Yulsman was there, he and his wife, and they're from Florida. So being up behind Tenaya Lake, where you're pretty high, was a real revelation. And when we went to leave, nobody wanted to go by the trail. It goes back down to Tenaya Lake. Uh, you're actually behind Tenaya Peak, pardon me. Anyway, and I said, OK, well, we can head off cross country here and we'll run into another trail. It'll take us out. And Jerry looked at me and said, you can do that. And he was so astounded because, you know, Florida is very flat. And so he couldn't believe that anybody could just kind of walk cross country and get somewhere. And I said, <laughs> honestly, uh, lots of people did this before there were trails. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, these old timers were there with mules. They were with, they had a 20 by 24 glass plate, wet plate yeah. collodium negatives. Uh, they, they would have to be careful not to break their, yeah. their, their, uh, their film, uh, what would be their film. 
uh, that wasn't even pre-processed. Uh, there were no, uh, the only trails that existed were previous pack trails or uh, Native American uh, paths. And, um, and so the, it's amazing what they did. Uh, and, and Ansel, when he first um, did his climbing, uh, they used to tie each other together with window sash. Uh, rope so that they so that they wouldn't uh, and they thought they imagined that they might you know if one person slipped it wouldn't pull the others with them <laughs> but uh, yeah Steve Sally Steve? yeah you uh yeah hello hello everybody it's nice to see you too I've been watching uh Steve you you should tell the group well, I can tell the group there was a time in Death Valley when you were getting some of your sand dune shots. And we were there, what, early early June. And it had to have been almost 100 and, what, 18, 20 degrees. And uh, of course, Steve waits for the right time of day, you know, for the right light as the sun goes down for the dunes, for the long shadows. But we wound up waiting from what, about two in the afternoon under a mesquite bush. We crawled oh, under a mesquite bush to protect ourselves from, from the sun and the heat. Do you remember that, hi? Oh, sure. Oh you bet. my God, it was hot. But you got your shots. <laughs> 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 but we were there with all the sticks and, uh, you know, and the little lizards and, oh, geez. <laughs> Quite a few adventures, yeah. Any any uh, other questions? <laughs> I think your son wants to ask you a question. All right. It's, an, it's not a question, Dad. I just wanted to say that was a really great presentation. It was nice reliving all those uh, experiences and those photographs with you today. So thanks for thanks for doing this, and thanks to the Fresno Art Museum for inviting you. Great thank job. you. And thank you. Th and thank you to my husband, Steve, whom I've shared so many of these adventures and to the art museum. It, it, I just learn things all over again and new things, hon. Thank you too. You all have to go down there and take a look at these shows uh, before they're down, be, be, before they shift. I mean, the next uh, slate of shows is going to be great too, but uh it's a really special combination of shows. And uh, this is one of the nicer venues for the Ansel Adams uh, uh, work in their permanent collection. And Sarah really did a great job uh, arranging that. And thank you so much, Michelle, uh, for directing uh, uh, and hurting all of our, <laughs> our, our desires into uh, um, a very accessible, beautiful, uh, space and and uh, uh, thanks again for all of that. Well, thank you, Steve. It was a stellar presentation. Your work is magnificent, and I just want people to know um, because of our two seasons we have every year now, instead of rotating shows out every three months, we have six months long runs. But we do carry Steve's books in our <laughs> museum store, and they are gorgeous. And it's a way you can access his work, and we also sell some of his prints. I made a studio visit to Steve and Sally, but I never really had a chance to look at so many individual works and except in the books. So thank you, it was a true treat. And you're a plethora of historical perspectives. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Well, well, if there's no more questions, thank you. we yeah. could say goodbye and have a happy Earth Day for the rest of the day. So we thank everybody for joining us this afternoon. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks yes, again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>